Amen. So uh, this is going to be the third and final uh, message in a series that I've been preaching essentially on uh, uh, the wisdom of a plan or the wisdom of encountering God and receiving a plan. Uh, if you've missed the last two services, I'll recap it uh, quickly, and then I'll go into the message. But uh, before I do that, I want you to know that on the website at thenewburnchurch.org, we archive all of the messages that we've done here in the past, and you can go and watch those. Um, and there's one in particular that I would have you go back to reference. Um, honestly, uh, it's probably one of the most powerful messages I've ever heard. It just happened to come out of this house. And I'm talking, you know, T.D. Jakes, Bill Johnson, you name your pastor, it doesn't matter. This word that came forth, it was actually this Thursday. How many of you were here Thursday? It was so anointed. There was something on this message that was like when, when the past and the present and the future all collide and you just feel that moment where it's launching you into the destiny that you have for your life. And then there was an activation that everybody participated in, and I've heard so much feedback, so I want to encourage you to go on the website, newburnchurch.org, go to the Thursday night service and, and press play on it. Uh, it. It happened to come from one of our very own, Chris, Chris Kidwell. Anybody else enjoyed as much as me, or is that just me, right? <laughs> like, I just want to be like, Chris, come back up and share that again, right? It was that good. But uh, if I may, I want to share a couple testimonies, because I feel like... Uh, the, the word I want to talk about today uh, is thankfulness, and um, it's part of the plan, and I'm going to do a review uh, quickly, but uh, let me do the review, and then I'll give you the testimony. You can throw that image up whenever you get a chance, um, but in part one, I talked about how God, he doesn't conceal his plan from us, he conceals his plans for us so that we might seek his face and, and grab a hold of the, uh, of the plans of our lives. And that the basis of that first message was that all of creation, everything that you see, everything you'll ever encounter is part of a divine plan. It was all created by plan. So that was the basis of that message from Genesis to the Revelation. It all reveals God's plan. I also talked about in that first message how Jesus even had to uncover the plans of God. Remember, he's in the garden praying, hey, Father, if there's any other way than to have me crucified, go ahead and take this cup from me. And God says, no, this is the plan. And then Jesus says, then your will, which is another word for your plan, be established and be done in my life. Mary is another example where she gets pregnant. She's like, hey, if, if this is your will, then your will be established, right? So that was what I talked about. I also gave you guys a quick warning, and you can write this down in Psalm 64, 6, which just simply warns us to not create plans on our own without the will of God, because what ends up happening is those plans don't come to pass, or if they do, you kind of limp along. And uh, there's a great warning there. So the key to that first message was planning with God is the key. And uh, in that plan, I asked you guys some questions, or I asked you to ask yourself a series of questions, like what's the most important for you? Basically, what's the vision? Uh, what do you love to do? What energizes you? What is the core message of your life? And we went through these series of questions, and then you quickly realize why I asked those questions last week, because in last week's message, I simply talked about how the, the summary of that last message would be freedom, and that I said that we want to look at the Word of God and what God says is freedom through his son, Jesus Christ. And we turn to, to uh, Galatians, and I read the majority of chapter 5, and I would encourage you to go back and read the, the majority or the entire chapter of, of Galatians chapter 5, which he sim simply uh, explains to us to be intimate enough uh, to be imitators of Jesus. So be intimate enough with God and with Jesus to be imitators of Jesus because if we can see him, we can copy him and be like him. When we encounter him, we become more like him. But today, I would say today's final message on wisdom of the plan uh, would be something that's been slowly revealing to being revealed to me, almost kind of like, like somebody planned it. And it happens to fall on Father's Day as if somebody planned it. Now, I'll tell you, humbly and honestly, that I'm just not that smart. Natalie knows the calendar. I don't, have a, I don't even know what a calendar is, let alone be able to plan out three weeks and have it land on Father's Day. I'm just not that smart. I didn't even know I was going to preach today until a few days ago, so I'm not that smart. But somebody is. And this past few weeks, God's been revealing to me the power, the power, pow, power, let me say it again, power, power, in the word of God through the thankfulness that you can begin to exercise and operate in the power of God through being thankful. And I want to share how this works, um, a quick testimony of, of being thankful. 
I was uh, uh, in my uh, bed, uh, upper room, which is kind of like a bedroom, bonus room, office. It's like the everything room, and it's also my prayer room. And as I'm praying, it's about six in the morning, and I'm just in this state of thankfulness. Just something came upon me, not to approach God with uh, uh, the needs of my day or an agenda or, hey, God, look how important I am. Did you know I have these things that have to be accomplished? None of that. It was just I went into this state of thankfulness. And the reason I mentioned that is because that's sometimes not the normal way I approach my prayer time. And I approached God in a state of thankfulness. Or I'm just, I, I started being thankful. Someone would call it counting your blessings. Thanking for my wife and my kids and my health and my home and my vibrancy and my extended family and for salvation. And just, it began to snowball. It was like it was hard to get that little engine started, but once the thankfulness engine started rolling, about 10 minutes into this time of thankfulness, um, two things happened. My cell phone began to text message me from a business partner of mine where it was, just ex- it was like text message. Two minutes later, text message. And they would say like, you need to call me. A couple of minutes later, seriously, call me. A couple of minutes later, like, if you don't call me, I'm going to explode. And, and this is a distraction in a way because I'm trying to stay in thankfulness. So I keep putting the cell phone down. The other thing that happened was it began to turn into praise. My thankfulness for what God had done, who, what he had you know, provided for me in my life, turned into praise. It was like, thank you for what you are doing and what you are going to do in my life because I can be thankful for my past and I can plan for my future, but I don't live in either one of them. Like you can learn from your past, you can prepare for the future, but you live in the present. And there's something that shifted. I became present as I began to praise him for the things that were coming. See, if he's done something for you in your past, he's more than likely going to continue the pattern. He's a good God. He doesn't change. Did he bring you salvation? Is there any greater gift? Is he going to stop giving good gifts? He's a giver of good gifts. And I want to tell you today that I want to teach about how thankfulness moves us into praise, and then what happens is he goes out on our behalf. So I finally get done about 30 minutes of prayer, and I call my partner up. I say, hey, what's going on? And then let me, let me tell you how awesome God is. He says, I don't know what you've been doing, Brent. This is my friend, my partner. He says, but here's what I've been doing. And he goes on to give me this litany of this amazing opportunity that just opened up literally in the last 30 minutes. He's like, I'm, I'm retired now. I'm out trimming my trees in my little posh neighborhood. And my neighbor's like, hey, I got trees that need to be trimming. And he goes, well, why are you home? Like, you should be working. And he's like, oh, this is my vacation. And uh, he's like, well, I'll help trim your trees. Long story short, he invites them together. This guy's like the CEO of all the hospitals in Florida. And they just connected and, and presented an opportunity that, that I happen to be a part of. And so my partner says, well, what were you up to this morning? Kind of elbowing me a little bit, like, look what I've been doing. And I said, well, I've actually been praying. I've been in a state of thankfulness. I've been in a state of praise. And God will move out on your behalf. Now, one time, I, you know, a lot of people won't build a, a lifestyle of thankfulness on one occurrence. They just won't. So I'm inquisitive. I look for patterns in my life. God tends to show up in patterns. Plans are patterns, right? Two by four is there. A two by four is there. A two by four is there, right? There's patterns. So I try it again. This time we're on vacation at, at, at the beach up in Surf City, and it's early in the morning. I just get into this state of thankfulness. This is what it looks like usually. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. I, and it's shifted into praise, and my phone starts blowing up. Text message, text message. You got to call me. You got to call me. Same guy, same process, same situation. He calls up and says, this whole realm just opened up. I need to send you a resume of some guy that wants to be involved. It was just like supernatural, right? Two times... All that does is set a course, right? Pilots, you know that plot A, plot B just sets a direction. Still isn't enough for most of us, right? Third time is the charm, some people say. But three is a pattern. So I told Natalie this, and she's like, well, when are you going to get back on your face and pray again, (laughs) right? She's like, get back in there and pray. I'll cook a meal. I'm like, yes, (laughs) ma'am. So, (laughs) right? So the third time ha- just happened to happen on Friday, just this past Friday. I was literally sharing this. I'm waiting for my cell phone to start buzzing, by the way, just so you know. Because as I'm telling this exact testimony with two friends of mine, Daryl and Kristen, here in the church, and we were out on a business uh, uh, meeting, I began to testify and glorify God as to how good he is through thankfulness. I just told them the exact thing I just told you. And as I'm telling them, my phone begins to ring 
And I pick it up, and I, it's in Chicago. It says Chicago, Illinois, and we're driving. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's just probably someone trying to sell me something. And this is more important. Let me tell you the testimony. And I continue to tell the testimony. And a minute later, my phone rings again. Same number, Chicago, Illinois. And I, I smart alecly joke, oh, they must think they're really important to call me twice. Like, that's the oldest trick in the book, right? Like, call once. If they don't answer, call again because you're super important, right? So I don't answer. I continue to tell the testimonies of the thankfulness and the praise of God, and it rings again the third time. Now it's a different number from Chicago. Oh, I say, I I jokingly say, I should probably answer it, huh? He must be really important. And I pick up the phone, and it's a guy I met in uh, uh, at Bethel like two months ago, a month and a half ago, and he's the head of uh, like a FEMA response unit for all of Chicago. And we were talking back then. He's like, we really need to do some business together. So he's calling me on the phone, and I'm, my mouth just drops. And I'm like, as we're driving. And uh, as I begin to just talk with him, he says, listen, I don't want to take up your ton of your time, but we need to do business, and we need to do it now. And, he, and we just hung up the phone, and we decided to talk later. The reason I tell you those testimonies is I believe that thankfulness prepares the way for the plans of God to start to move, but they don't move the way you think they will. See, when I talk about a plan, many of us are like, yeah, what is my role? What do I need to do in the plan? But we've mistaken it as, as believers is that our role is to live in thankfulness, to live in continual prayer and in continual praise, and that the doing is of the Lord. Like, wouldn't that be awesome if that was in the Bible, not just coming out of my mouth? Wouldn't that be good to know that that's the word of God? Open up your Bibles. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Thessalonians. First, Thess- Thess- First Thessalonians, say that twice fast, especially if you have a lisp. All right, First Thessalonians, and we're going to go to chapter 5. The, the word of the Lord is clear on the state of thankfulness, the state of praise and prayer, and is also very clear on what our role and his plan for our life is, and then what his responsibility is in this process. The, the caution here would be like, well, are you saying that we don't have to do anything? And I would say, I would caution you that I think we've erred on the side of trying to do everything and omitting the Father from the process rather than to do what the Word says and be responsible for our part. But the Word says we're to strive to enter into the rest. If there's one thing you're called to try to do is to strive to enter into the rest of God. How do you do that? Like, doesn't that seem like an oxymoron? Like striving to enter into rest. That's because it's so hard. Everything in the world wants to distract you from just stopping for a moment and beginning to begin to give God thanks and praise. It, it's even hard when something amazing happens. Oh, we just had a baby. Thank you, God. Oh, hold on, what? You know, it's so hard. But the world's job they're doing a good job at it. They're doing good. We have the opportunity now in this, in this time to really do what we're called to do. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. I'll read it. Chapter 5. It says this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And in everything, give thanks. So people are like, what's the will of God for my life? This next sentence will tell you. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you and for your life. So I purposed my life to meditate and practice these three commandments. There's really three commandments there, right? Rejoice, always. Pray without ceasing, which would be another way of like always be praying. And in everything, give thanks. So one of the things I just want to share in the, in the few minutes that we have left is there's three specific areas where Jesus expresses thanks. And they're always followed by power. What's another way for me to describe power? Like stuff happens in the natural that shouldn't happen. Things happen. Things move. Uh, I'll go there in a moment, but it it perplexes me is to like those three times that that I just told you, the testimonies, um, were those people planning to call me at that moment? Or did something happen? And I'm going to call them and find out. Because I believe something happened on the inside of them while I was giving thanks and praise, and God whispered or shouted or poked or does whatever God does and says, you need to call Brent right now. 
I really do. I really do. You know, they didn't schedule to call me at that time. It was like God prompts the believer and the unbeliever to move on your behalf. He really does. Let's go to the word here. Three different areas where Jesus demonstrates the power of thankfulness. The first is found in Matthew uh, chapter 15. This is where Jesus is giving thanks, thanks for food. Um, in, in verses 35, 36, it says, Before feeding the 4,000, he told the crowd to sit down on the ground, and then he took the seven loaves and the fishes. And we all know this story, right? As a kid, they're probably, maybe they're learning it today back there, right? You know, we, break, we take out the goldfish and, the, uh, and, and, and we break it, right? And we're like, yay, and then the bread. Um, but the key to this entire parable or this message is that he gave thanks. And then he, he first gave thanks, then he broke them, and giving them to the disciples, they turned to the people, and they all ate, and they were all satisfied, and there were leftovers. See, even Jesus understood that entering into the thankful relationship with the Father produces supernatural results. It begins to manifest on earth that which is in heaven. Because all provision is laid up through the Father, and he wants to pull that into this reality, so he begins to give thanks first, then it happens. Ah, well, once isn't enough, right? It wasn't even enough for the disciples, because the second time that they were going to feed the people, Jesus is like, hey, you saw it done, now you go do it. And they were like... Huh? Once isn't enough for us. We need to see it happen at least two or three times. You're no different than the disciples. Isn't that good news? That should, that, that, that should set somebody free when I said that. Like, it's okay to say, God, show me. It's okay to question the Father. It's not okay to question His Word, but it's okay to question Him and say, show, show me. I wanna, I'm believing. I'm hungering and thirsting for the things of righteousness, and, and I want to know and he will constantly show it to you. So let's go to the next place where he gives thanks for answered prayer. It's in, found in John chapter 11. So turn there. This is fun, right? We're staying in the New Testament. When I first, began, <laughs> when I first got saved, right? My mom was just like, just read John. And in particular, just the red words. And I'm like, I can do that. I didn't know what the red words were. Like, I didn't even know that when I got saved. Well, the red words are Jesus, like quote, quotes, by the way. Woo. All right, so let's go to John chapter 11. As John continues to uh, describe the scene, he says here in uh, verse 41, 42, then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. But I said, and this is where he's going to lay, raise Lazarus, by the way, right? But, uh, here, let me go back. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. So his thanksgiving expressed the, uh, the unshaken assurance that God heard and answered Jesus' prayer. See, he was showing like, I'm about, he was showing you a process. Lazarus is dead. Watch how this works. God, I thank you that you're about to raise this man. Then when he got there and raised him, they could see the process. For the disciples, I guess this was now the second time, right? There's a pattern being established. Thankfulness. The commanded word of God, supernatural event. Wow. Let's see if it happens again. Is this good for anybody else? Because I love this stuff. Uh, let's, go to, let's go to the third, third part in Luke. We're not going to leave the New Testament. Go to Luke chapter 22. And I'm going to wrap up after this. So Jesus is constantly alluding to the plan of God as he gets the prayer and he understands in the garden, like, hey, this is it. He understands from the Old Testament prophets that he has to be denied by the religious, beaten, broken, shattered, crushed, and murdered. And yet he finds a way, understanding the joy of this, of this plan, that's beset before him, that ultimately he had you in mind, that he's even able to be thankful for that. What I want to share more than anything is the gospel today is wherever, whatever, however God is moving in your life right now, the things that you're going through is part of the plan. 
I'm not saying he injects negative things, but negative things happen to your, in your life. Romans 8.28, it says, according to him, that all things work to your good. So when things happen in your life, we don't have to say, well, God caused this. We can say, God's about to use this. And ultimately, at the end of it, if you're already saved, you, you have yourself saved, healed, and delivered, he doesn't stop there. Because like a good, good father, you're not his only kids. There's a whole bunch out there. And he wants to use you in your situation so that he can go get the rest of his kids. That sounds like a good, good father, doesn't it? That sounds like what our, my father would do. My, my son was sitting here, Mike, and we talked about uh, Toronto or uh, Brownsville. My son, was, he, was, he wouldn't let go of me today. It was just awesome. I was like, I love it. It's Father's Day. He's just, hey, and he looked at me and he says, Dad, I want to stand on your shoulders. Now, he literally wanted to do that because he loves to do that. But it reminded me of what Brownsville really is, and now we can say it kind of was, was there's an opportunity for us to stand on the shoulders of our forefathers who have advanced the kingdom to the place where we can now say, is mass repentance over a city and a nation and a, a country and over the world possible? Yes. How do we know that? Brownsville. Is a mass outflowing of healing and the Father's love and barking like a dog and weird manifestations and all the good things that come with it, is it possible? Yes, Toronto. Because we have these patterns moving throughout time and space to show us what's next. I'm telling you the third and this final and this amazing outpouring of God's love and power is coming. It's so thin you can taste it in the atmosphere. You don't even have to be a Christian for a really long time to have the discernment. Just know if you feel like you just nudge up against it and kind of press your elbow against it, it might just bust loose. Does anybody else feel that? It's like the baby's been pushing, the baby's been groaning, the whole earth is crying, all of creation is groaning, evil is being what it's supposed to do, evil, everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. I'm telling you, this third part of this pattern is upon us, maybe even now. It, it, I feel like it could happen right now, I really do. This third part where Jesus, whoa, where Jesus gives thanks for his actual crucifixion is found in Luke 22 in verse 14 through 20. Let's read it real quick. Oh, I was showing Lance how to highlight in my Bible, so now I've, he, he, he went to work. He's got highlights everywhere. It says, when the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table, talking about uh, the Last Supper and communion. And Jesus said to them, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until the, me until the meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup of wine and did what? Gave thanks. Thankfulness opens up the covenant of supernatural power to enter into whatever you're doing. He repeats the process with the bread. He took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples. He says, this is my body in which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. I, f I feel like his thanksgiving was like expressed as his unshakable unwavering just assurance that God he hears his prayers. That not only does God hear Jesus' prayers, but answers them. Um, I believe it's why we can go to Jesus and Jesus says, when you come to me, ask of me anything and I'll do it. Right? Let's pray, let's pray. I, pr I pray, I'm asking For a super, I'm thankful, Father, for what you've done in the past. I am so thankful for what you did in Brownsville, what you did in the Ebertes Islands, all the revivals of the past. I'm thankful for the men of God and the women of God that you have got, brought forth to teach, to preach, and, t and train the Smith Wigglesworths, all those that have come before us that have set the foundation. They are like fathers, and we stand father on top of father, and we stand on the shoulders of those that have gone before us. And in fact, there's a great cloud of witnesses that we can also be thankful for who are looking 
looking down upon us right now saying, yeah, go ahead and command the word. Speak the word of the Lord. The whole, all of heaven, all of earth, all of creation is groaning for you to rise up as sons and daughters of the living God and to say revival like we've never seen, come now. And we're thankful, but we praise you for what is to come. We have the assurance that we ask this in Jesus' mighty name, not as an end cap to our prayer, but as the transition to what we know will happen. We are asking under the authority of Jesus that the revival that would bring in the multitudes of salvations, not just in New Bern, but across the city, the state, the nation, and around the world, actually is for us to speak and to give thankfulness, to pull it down from heaven, to give praise to give praise. And the reason, Father, is showing me right now is because when it happens, we can say, we can mark it. We can say it was thankfulness. It was praise. It was in the name of Jesus that we asked of these things. And they began to move and they began to move, open up. This is the plan of God over your life. This is the plan of God over your life for you to rejoice, for you to be thankful, for you to be constantly in prayer. This is the plan and the will of his life so that you might enter into co-laboring and co-suffering with Jesus to bring a salvation into this, into this great world. I'm telling you, Charleston, was a, it, it was a pivot point. It was a pivot point. It was a pivot point. They had ways they could have responded. Holy Spirit that there would be personal revival that would impact family, household revivals, whoa, that would bleed into neighborhood revivals, plural, that would bleed into city-wide revivals like little wildfires that merge. See what happens with the wildfire? It doesn't just, it's not one big fire. It's a bunch of them. It's when they get together. It just consumes everything. And I pray an all-consuming fire that you are, God, would begin to invade every house that's represented here. And I will tell you that there are enough present here to set the entire east coast of the United States ablaze. And I declare in the name of Jesus. And right now, I, the Lord just told me to bring to your memory your relatives that extend out from this region. They might be in New York, or they might be in the Midwest. They might be around the the country, that that fire upon you and your household would literally leap to where they're at. I've got friends in Kansas City and Indianapolis. Boom, let the fire of God go from me to them now in the name of Jesus. Let the fire of God be transferable, not just in good word, but in the power of God where there's transformation, where people are being saved, healed, and delivered, hopefully all at one time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to wrap up. Holy Spirit, this isn't, just a, this isn't just a good word. This is a time for us to see the fullness and the expectation of Thessalonians 5.16 to be found in the perfect will of God and that we all are carriers of the presence, the, the fire that's happening in this city. That the burn isn't just a cool name for the worship that's breaking out. It's actually what's happening. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't want to just encourage you to come to the burn. This isn't a promotion for the burn. I'm telling you, there is a fire and you're a coal and you belong in a fire. For you to be outside of the fire is actually abnormal. Get in the fire, get in the burn. And I'm telling you, there's gonna be, well, there's people in here that are literally gonna be like cheerleading carriers of what happens there that night and it's gonna bleed out of that place and set this, set this entire city on fire. Holy Spirit, I pray that this word today would be met with com, uh, conviction of, of the Holy Spirit on side of each person. I pray right now, if there's any that have not been filled with the Holy Spirit, and they say, yes, I want that, that you would come forth at the end, I would ask that the fathers of this house, if you're a father, meaning you've, you've given uh, a seed and had a child, boom, that's the definition of father, and you're in this building, I want those guys to come forward. I want you to receive prayer from the fathers of this house. Let them father you. Let them speak the identity of who you are. Um, Ronnie, Mike, men of God, would you come if you're a father? Please come. Yep, yep, if you're, if you're uh, trained up in the house here and you're a father, we want you to just lay hands on those that are, that are want to come. Come on up, yep. Listen, these men, go and put some music on. These men carry something special. Um, I joked with my wife today, and she wrote a little, I said, listen, I mean, I couldn't be a father without you. You know what I mean? And I meant to like, I'm like, oh, wait a second, literally. <laughs> like, it, t it, takes, it takes two. Um, but these fathers, I, f I feel there's a fathering of this revival that you guys release upon everybody here. So I want you to come forth with prayer. Let them speak the blessings of a father over you. And I just pray that today you go out
set ablaze. In Jesus' name, I love you.